Winning a Magic the Gathering Pro Tour is often the best moment in a player's life. The right mix of preparation, skill, extreme amounts of luck, and just the right deck selection need to align perfectly to get you there. And I guess these must have been extremely skillful or lucky players because their decks were terrible. Upgrade your terrible deck on Card Market. The pro system in Magic the Gathering has players siphon through various tournament levels to finally get to the main stage. This is the average player's journey. After proudly pirating your blue frog deck and becoming the best player that plays in your friend Martha's living room on Sundays, you decide to make your way to the local game store. And once you become the top dog at your local game store, you finally sign up for your first Pro Tour qualifier to make it to the big leagues. So the Pro Tour is this thing that so many people used to and still occasionally do try to hit, right? The payoff, the sign that you made it as a competitive player, right? You've played at the Pro Tour. If you went to a local game store, you, there'd be rumors like, oh, this guy, he goes to every Pro Tour. Like, they, they, they play every Pro Tour and they finish quite okay. But before you get there, you have to go through these steps. Nowadays, there are so many people who want to qualify for the Pro Tour that you generally have to play a tournament that qualifies you to the tournament that qualifies you to the Pro Tour. But once you finally do well enough in both, you can call your mom and tell her you made it because you're officially a Pro Magic player. Outside of special events like Invitationals or Worlds, the Pro Tour was by far the most consistent, high-level display of Pro Magic, right? This brings us to Pro Tour Avicen Restored. At Pro Tour Avicen Restored in Barcelona, you could only play with cards from the three sets that took place in Innistrad. Enter Alexander Haynes. He entered his second Pro Tour with an odd choice of deck. With this pool of 666 cards, most people chose to pilot a green and white aggressive deck with Avicen's Pilgrim and Wolf Here's Silverheart. But Alexander Haynes decided to come to the event with a deck that some would call ambitious. For Avicen Restored, as for so many block constructed formats, aggro decks that kind of just played a good beater every turn were actually really good. But Alexander Hain, <laughs> he didn't decide on a good deck. <laughs> Alexander Hain used a mechanic that was only introduced in Avicen Restored itself in the final set of the block, Miracle. Blue White Miracles was a deck that revolved around a new mechanic called Miracles, where these cards would usually have a high cost for their power level, but you could cast them at a reduced cost if they were the first card you drew this turn. The intended feeling was to go into your turn knowing you were in trouble and tapping the top of your library hoping for a miracle. Players were generally unsure going into the Pro Tour whether the mechanic was powerful enough to make it. Turns out it wasn't. Or was it? Now normally miracle cards are very expensive. Look at Terminus for example, a six mana sweeper that gets rid of all creatures on the board, but if it's the first card you draw that turn, it's a single white mana. In older formats like Legacy, those cards were actually crazy powerful because of cards like Brainstorm, Ponder, Sensei's Divining Top, cards that let you set up the top of your deck reliably. And Alexander Hain made use of all the tools available in Block Constructed to set up the top of the deck. Which is? None. Oh. <laughs> you had to actually miracle the cards. So he used hope. That's what he used. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. You understand this is Block Constructed, right? Yes. You understand this is not a legacy GP or anything like that? Well, I, I wasn't quite sure. But <laughs> I definitely saw Terminus as a playable card in this format. Yes. I definitely saw Temporal Mastery as possibly a playable card, although yeah. I was pretty skeptical about it. Uh, you know, Entreat the Angels, Decree of Justice has been a fine card in the past. Devastation Tide? How, yeah. how does this card work for you? And you have four of them. Right, four of them. I am uh, flabbergasted. Apart from the miracle aspect, the only what I would call good card in the deck is Tamio. Tamio, five mana planeswalker, that was for the time actually really powerful because it could lock your opponent out of resources and then draw a bunch of cards and the ultimate just immediately wins the game. But um, yeah, to get to that point, you had to utilize the miracle cards to kind of get control of the game. Fun fact, if you ultimated Tamyo, there was one dissipate in the deck and it's only to just counter all your opponent's creatures from there on. But Hain had a trick up his sleeve because with cards like Think Twice or Thought Scour, he could technically draw a card during his opponent's turn, which is still technically the first card he drew that turn. Instant Speed Terminus is really strong. The issue is if you don't know what you're drawing, an Instant Speed Devastation Tide when you need a Temporal Mastery is, 
not so strong. But Alex must have been wearing his lucky pants that weekend because he managed to draw the right miracles just at the right time, and using that and a combination of skill, he managed to bring that deck into the top eight, which he almost ended up being kicked out of at the first round. In the quarterfinals, Alexander Hain played John Finkel. Ooh. John Finkel. Except Haynes realized that he presented an illegal deck. By citing in more cards than he'd cited out, which was illegal at the time, the judge opted for giving him a game loss. Not on John Finkel's watch, because John Finkel said, I'm here to play, please don't do this. And the judge was like, all right, well then, let's go, let's play. It looks like a Ricardo Tessitore, the head judge for the event, uh, just stepping in for a, a conversation, not quite sure what's happening there. They're counting the number of cards in Haynes' library. It looks to me like John Finkel has just said, I would rather play game five than have you take, take a win. game loss. I think that's what's just happened. Alex managed to pull a final win in the game and somehow take down the whole tournament. And that was the deck that even him would not recommend anyone entering the tournament again. Treat the angels for five. Plays increasing savagery. Yep, sure. No blocks. Attack Tamio. No blocks. No Tamio's blocks. Dead. There it Tamio. is! Hallelujah! Epic end to an epic Bravo. Sunday. Now you might think, what we've discussed is bad, but... It was. <laughs> there's uh, there's worse. <laughs> no! It's 1996 and Ole Rade is a 16-year-old with his cool green and red spiders deck. He could have just signed up for the junior version of the Pro Tour, but he decided if he's playing his first Pro Tour, he was going to play with people who could drink and vote. This is Ice Age block constructed. That's the first block constructed, actually. It is the first block constructed format ever, and only cards from Ice Age and Alliances Two are legal. And his deck choice baffles people who look at it now and even at it back then, because it was just not very good. For context, his finals opponent, Sean Fleischmann, was playing the big bad control deck of the time, with staples like Thawing Glaciers, Counterspells, Force of Will, and Swords to Plowshares. And Raddy was playing a deck with... Three mana spiders that dealt two damage. Let me tell you about his all-stars of creatures in the deck. Four giant trapdoor spider. Four woolly spider. <laughs> so, both of those are only good if your opponent has flying creatures. Yes, but, oh. you know, they're spiders. They're pretty cool. Apart from that, the deck also features great threats such as Storm Shaman, which isn't as good if you only have 11 red sources in your entire deck. Or how about Orcish Cannoneers, which cost double red after the deck usually wants to start out off a of forest and a Finthorn Elves, which you then <laughs> can't cast your three drop. And he was playing Deadly Insect. It's a five mana creature that trades with a squire. I know creatures at the time were famous for being bad, but not this bad. You've also got Stormbind, a three mana enchantment that you need to invest another two mana into for it to do two damage. And you also need to invest another card. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just a mess of a deck. And we all know that you want to draw your good cards in your deck as often as possible. And Ole made a point to draw his best cards even more often by playing six baubles, just as a way to cycle. Just cheap artifact that cycle for another card just to get closer to those deadly insects. It's a pile of a deck. But Raddy proved that he had skill because he took down the whole tournament with his brew and kept winning further and further tournaments with, uh, granted, much better decks. Now I know we're making fun of these decks, but imagine the flex. You not only qualified to play with the 400 best Magic players in the world, but you also got to be the top player in that room for that weekend, and with a deck that people generally consider to be bad? Now that is what I call street cred. We also put a third terrible deck that we put in the pinned comment below. If you want to see the deck list, they actually forgot to register four cards in their deck. But now you tell us, is there another deck that is the worst deck to ever win a Magic the Gathering Pro Tour, and why is it Mono Green Tron? <laughs> oh god, I'm gonna be so mad. <laughs> <laughs>